Here we're going to focus on the appendicular skeleton. Now, the bones of the upper and lower limbs is what we're focusing on, but this is also going to include the support structures that allow us to con connect the limbs to the axial skeleton. So that's going to be the pectoral and the pelvic girdles. The functions, um, basically they include the movement of the limbs, which is sort of self-obvious, but when you have the skeleton connected to muscles and you have limbs, these limbs are going to play a key role in the production of heat and the release of heat from body core. This is thermal regulation. You also have to note that the functions of the girdles, the pectoral will support the upper limbs, the pelvic will support the lower limbs. Now the latter part of this chapter on, focuses on the girdles and on the limb bones, but it really puts a lot of emphasis on bone markings. Therefore, I'm really encouraging everyone uh, to stay on top of this particular area here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at this. First, we're going to start off with the uh, pectoral girdle and then move down through the upper limbs. Then we're going to move through the, pec the pelvic girdle and go through the lower limbs. The clavicles and the scapula connect the upper limbs to the axial skeleton. The clavicles articulate, that means to form a joint with the sternum at the sternoclavicular joint. The sternal end meets with the clavicular notch of the sternum. Okay, and when I say the sternal end, I'm talking about the clavicle. The clavicle will have a sternal end and it will have an acrimonial end. Now, uh, there are two joints between the pelvic girdles and the axial skeleton, and this is one joint on each side. The acrimonial end of the clavicle articulates with the acrimonion. The scapular uh, has the uh, acrimonioclavicular joint. There are several ligaments that are important. They stabilize uh, the conoid tubercle and the costal tuberosity. And so you can see here, the acrimonial end will be attaching to the scapula. This side here, the sternal end, will be attaching to the sternum. We have a conoid tubercle here and a costal tuberosity here. Uh, these are attached to particular uh, ligaments that provide for stability. Now, here you see the clavicle. Here you see the sternal clavicular notch, uh, excuse me, the joint, with the jugular notch and the clavicular notch. Here's the clavicular notch on this side. Notice that you have the acrimony uh, clavicular joint right here. The acrimonium of the scapula is this part of the scapula. There are going to be certain processes that extend for the scapula. And then notice that the scapula will also play a critical role in the attachment to the humerus. We're going to get more into that in a minute. So this is the pectoral girdle here. One thing you may notice is that it's not the most uh, secure. For example, one of the misnomers is that a lot of people would say, well, that big waif structure here in the back of the scapula is attached to the ribs. No, it's not. It's attached to muscles. And really, there is no attachment. So the attachment for the pectoral girdle relies solely on this arrangement right here, which is also interesting because the clavicle is one of the more commonly uh, or more commonly occurring breakages if you're going to have any breaking of the bones. Now the scapula, if we look at the anterior view, consists of the acrimon, uh, acrimonium, which is a continuous with the scapular spine, uh, the coracoid process, which includes the superior uh, medi uh, medial, not the medical, I'm sorry about that, typo error there, uh, and lateral borders. The axilla, is the armpit area, and basically these muscles that position the scapula attached to each of the borders. Uh, the corners of the triangular shape, you have basically the uh, superior angle, inferior angle, and lateral angle. 
You have also a subscapular fossa, which is depression of the anterior surface. And you have also the glenoid cavity, which is kind of this cup shape, but I want to emphasize this. This is a shallow ball and socket uh, joint. It does not have the capability to carry the wherewithal for extended periods of time like you have with the femur and its ball and socket uh, joint there with the coaxial uh, uh, joints in the, pector uh, in the pelvic uh, girdle, which we'll get into later. This scapular articulation with the humerus forms what's called the glenohumeral humeral joint. The scapula, the posterior view, consists of the scapular spine, which is continuous with the acrimonium, uh, the supraspinous fossa, and the infraspinous fossa. These are uh, concave areas. The supraspinous is superior to the scapular spine. Uh, the concave area of the infraspinous fossa is also a concave area superior to the scapular spine. Uh, excuse me, it is inferior to the scapula spine. This is the scapula spine here. So think of it as sort of a dividing line. There was a, a typo error there. So you have the infraspinous fossa here, the supraspinous fossa is there. All right. Now, if you look head on at the glenoid cavity, you see that it's really not very deep. It's kind of a shallow. And that's part of what I'm trying to get as a point across to all the students here, because this is not something that you can expect to uh, hold on to. It gives you a lot of flexibility, such as tossing a baseball. We'll get more into this when we get into joints later. But as for carrying the entire weight of the body, it doesn't do it. It just doesn't do it. Once we get into these limbs, as I said, note the bone markings. You have the arm, which is known as the brachium, which is the, the upper one bone that we're going to be focusing on is the humerus. In the anterior view, this consists of the medial and lateral epicondyles. These are rounded surfaces. They develop proximal to the articulation. And they allow for additional muscle attachment sites. The capitulum, which is the lateral surface of the condyle. The trochlear, which is the spool-shaped medial portion of the condyle. The coronoid fossa, which is part of the trochlea, the radial fossa, which accommodates the portion of the head of the radius as elbow bends. This is important because we're going to get into the elbow joint in a bit. The deltoid tuberosity, which is a large rough elevation which the deltoid muscle attaches to. Also on the humerus, you're going to find the surgical neck, which marks the extension of the joint capsule. Keep in mind, that to hold this entire joint capsule of the glenohumeral humeral uh, joint, you've got to have a lot of support there with a lot of ligaments and wrappings, and you're going to get into that, of the joint capsule. The intertubicular uh, solstice, that's a groove between the greater and lesser tubercles and a large tendon that runs in the groove. The lesser tubercle and the great tubercle the lesser tubercle, you have a smaller projection that lies on the anterior medial surface of the epiphysis. The rounded projection of the lateral surface, difference here now, medial surface, lateral, of the epiphysis defines the lateral contour of the shoulder. So that's what the greater tubercle is. And then, of course, you have the head, which is the rounded end and articulates with the glenoid cavity. The posterior view consists of the oleocranal fossa, which is part of the trochlea which together with the coronoid fossa accepts projections from the ulna, which is part of the elbow joint, as the humeral ulnar joint. Note, as a result, you have a limited range of motion. So I'm going to just give it to you this way. If you straighten out your arm completely and you bend it forward uh, to the point where your hand gets to touch your shoulder, that's nice. You can do that. You can't do the opposite direction because this joint will not allow you to go backwards just because of the range of uh, the fossa and the projections, etc. You also have a radial groove, which crosses the inferior end of the deltoid tuberosity. The path marks the depression of the radial nerve. So here is where the radial nerve would be. Here is the greater tubercle, the lesser tubercle. Of course, we have the head. We have the anatomical neck, the surgical neck here the intertubicular sulcus. We have the shaft, the diaphesis. 
we have the deltoid tuberosity right here, the radial fossa down here, the coronoid fossa here, the trochlear, and then the capitulum, of course, the lateral epicondyle here and the medial epicondyle right here. Okay, this is the anterior view, this is the posterior view. The main point I want you to get an understanding is that right here, this oleocranal fossa and the joint, etc., fit nicely with the ulna, but they won't allow you to bend your arm all the way back. All non radius. Now, there are two parallel bones that support the antebrachium. This is the forearm. The anatomical position, the ulna lies medial to the radius. For a posterior view, the ulna consists of the oleocranon. The proximal end of the ulna uh, forms the point of the elbow. The head of the ulna, you have the ulnar head. This is a lateral surface articulates with the distal end of the radius to form the distal radial ulnar joint. Now, because you're going to have two bones next to each other, they're going to have several joints together. You're going to see this both in the forearm and in the lower leg when you have these pairing of bones, ulnar radius um, and the tibia and the fibula. Also, what you're going to have is a interosseous membrane there that's going to provide for stability, but we'll get into that in a few minutes. The ulnar styloid process is attached to the posterior lateral surface of the head. It is a triangular articular cartilage disc that separates the ulna head from the wrist bones. The radials consists of radial styloid process, which helps stabilize the wrist bones, articulates with the bones of the wrist. You have also an ulnar notch, which is the site of articulation with the head of the ulna. There we have the interosseous membrane. Keep in mind that basically you have to have some means to stabilize these two bones that are next to each other. On the interior view of the radius, that consists of the radial tuberosity, which marks attachment of the biceps brachii muscle, the neck, which extends from the radial head to the radial tuberosity, the head of the radius, which articulates with the capitulum of the humerus into the radial fossa of the humerus. The ulna consists of the radial notch. Okay, so we had a radius that consisted of a ulnar notch, and now we have a radial notch. There's some points here. The radial notch accommodates the head of the radius at the, appro the proximal radial ulnar joint. Then we have a coronoid process, which forms the inferior lip of the trochlear notch. During flexion, remember that's the joint movement, this process fits into the coronoid fossa of the humerus. In the trochlear notch, this articulates with the trochlear of the humerus at the elbow joint. Here we have the trochlear notch. On the back side of it, the posterior, you have the oleocranon. This is where you're going to have the humerus attach in. Now, because we have two bones, as you can see, we have an interosseous membrane here, which provides for stability. We also have a joint here, the, the distal radial ulna, and we also have a proximal radial ulnar joint, proximal closer to the main body in this case. Um, and the other thing is you have the head of the ulna here, which has an ulnar styloid process. You also have a radial styloid process, okay? Now we move into the wrist. The carpus, the wrist, the carpal bones, there are eight bones. You have a set that's proximal and a set that's distal. The proximal include the scaphoid, which is closest to the styloid process of the radius. It is in the lateral border of the wrist. The lunate, which refers to moon, comma-shaped structure, is next to the scaphoid and articulates with the radius. The triquium, three-cornered, is a small pyramid-shaped structure that articulates with the articular disc that separates the lunar head from the wrist. And then pisiform. Uh, it's like a pea. It looks very, very small. It's located anterior to the triquium. The distal uh, carpal bones include the trapezium, which is the table. That's the lateral bone of distal row. The trapezoid, which is kind of a wedge-shaped, like a trapezoid. And it is the proximal articulation with the scaphoid and articulation uh, with basically scaphoidal structure. Excuse me. The capitate, which is the head, that's the largest carpal bone. And then the hamate, which is 
referred to as hooked, is a prominent hook projecting anteriorly, as you can see this. So we have the pisiform, the small pea-like structure, the triquium, the lunate, <coughs> excuse me, the scaphoid. Now, mind you, right now, what you're looking at up here is the radius. Down he, over onto the side, here's the ulna. Now, for the distal ones, you have the hamate, the small one, which kind of hooks around it. The capitate, the trap, the uh, capitate, which is right here. The trapezoid and the trapeze trapezium. Okay. Take a look here at the next, the hand bones. Notice that we start off here, where the thumb is. One, two, three, four, five. Let me go over that. There are five metacarpal bones. They articulate with the distal carpal bones. The metacarpals basically form the fleshy, basically are in the fleshy part of the hand. They're identified by Roman numerals, one through five, beginning with the metacarpal that articulates with the trapeze trapezium, which is above the thumb. Now, below, after that, you have the, the phalanges. Phalanx means battalion. There's 14 bones. Basically, what happens is when you deal with the pollux, the thumb, you're only going to have two. Okay? So you're going to have a proximal and you're going to have a distal. All the other fingers, you're going to have three bones, four phalanges a proximal, a middle, and a distal. And you can see them right here. And now we're going to move into the lower or pelvic girdle, the uh, lower limbs. We are going to talk first about the hip bones, which are fused from the ilium, ischium, and pubis. And they consist, make up what we also refer to as the coaxial bones. The pelvis consists of the sacrum and the hip bones together. The ilium is noted for iliatic spines, which mark the attachment of muscles and ligaments. From the posterior view, you have the superior and the inferior iliatic spine. The anterior, you have the superior iliatic spines present there. And you have the greater sciatic notch, which is a passageway for large sciatic nerves, uh, for the large sciatic nerves to reach the legs. Excuse me. The iliatic fossa, this is a shallow depression that helps support abdominal organs. In the ilium, you have the auricular surface, which articulates with the auricular surface of the sacrum at the sacroiliac joint. The iliac tuberosity is a roughened area. It's an attachment for ligaments to stabilize the sacroiliac joint. The arcuate line, which is continuous with the pectineal line of the pubis. The gluteal line marks the attachment of important hip muscles and is distinguished by the anterior, inferior, and posterior. In the ischium, you have to deal with the ischial spine, which is superior to the lesser sciatic notch and marks where small blood vessels, nerves, and a small muscle pass. Continuing with the ischium, we have to deal with the ischial tuberosity, which is a roughened projection and bears the body's weight when you are seated. Um, the acetabulum, Basically, all three bones meet together in this socket, uh, concave socket, which articulates with the head of the femur. The acetabular notch is a gap in the bony rim of the acetabulum. You also have the structures of the ischial ramus, which connects to the inferior pubic ramus, the lunate surface, which is a smooth cup-shaped articular surface, and the obturator foramen. This is a space closed by a sheet of collagen fibers. Both sides provide a firm base for attachment of muscles for the hip. In the pubis bone, you have to be mindful of the pectineal line, which is a ridge that extends at the pubic tubercle, the superior and inferior pubic ramus, which is part of the boundary for the obturator foramens, and the pubic syphus. Now that's that pad of fibrocartilage it is located between the left and the right pubic bones. This is the pad that I was mentioning before that will have some modulation to it during the time of pregnancy because of the increased levels of relaxin, the hormone produced uh, in, I believe, by the placenta. And this will cause the expansion and thereby allow a relaxing of this particular fibrocartilage so that the birth canal, you can have the child go through, etc. Now, 
you can see the areas such as the acetabulum, the lunate surface, the acetabular notch. You can see the obturator foramen, the, the pubis, the ischial ramus, the inferior pubic ramus here, the pectineal line, which extends into the arcuate line, the auricular surface here, the iliac tuberosity here, the iliac crest, the iliac fossa, this is a depression area, the anterior inferior iliac spine, the superior pubic ramus, and then of course if you turn this around, you're going to see the gluteal lines, which would include the anterior, inferior, posterior. The posterior superior iliac spine, the posterior inferior iliatic spine, right there, and the greater sciatic notch. Moving onward, you can see how these three bones fuse together and create, uh, they also overlay into this acetabulum, which is extremely important as the joint for uh, the femur to joint to uh, uh, hip bone uh, joint. Here is where the pubic syphus is. When we talk about the pelvis, this consists of, as I mentioned before, the two hip bones, the sacrum also attached as well as the coccy. The pelvis is divided into a true pelvis and a false pelvis. The false pelvis, which extends uh, extend portions of the ilium superior to the pelvic brim, the true pelvis extends from either side of the base of the sacrum along the arcuate line and the pectineal line to the pubic syphus. You have the pelvic brim, which is the bony margin of the true pelvis, the pelvic inlet, which is the opening enclosed by the pelvic brim, and then the pelvic outlet. This is the opening bounded by the coccyx, the ischial tuberosities and the ischial spines and inferior border of the pubic syphus. You might be sitting there going, whoa, that was a lot. Here's some of the things you have to think about. You have here the false pelvis, basically going from the upper rim here to the upper rim there. Okay. Now, if you look in here, this is where you're going to start dealing with what would be the true pelvis down in here. The pelvic brim here, the pelvic inlet here. If you look at this from an inferior view, you'll see the pelvic outlet here, going from the coxial to the other aspects of the uh, pelvis, okay? This is extremely important because the male and female skeletons have significant differences. The two key areas when you're looking at bones to determine the sex is basically the skull and the pelvis. I do encourage you to review the chart and go over it. And if, if possible, go over the pelvises in the labs. You're going to notice a difference in mostly the skull and in the pelvis, particularly in the pelvis, to make distinctions for male and female. You'll notice that even the pubic angle, if you look down here, is less than 90 degrees. But for females, it's much larger. Okay, you're also going to see the obturator foramens being somewhat triangular for females, oval for males. Okay, you're going to see how the direction of the coccyx points, the pelvic outlet, the pelvic inlet, and you will just see the general appearances and make these differences down. I encourage you to take time to review this. Okay, and moving on. Now we're going to move into the femur which is referred to as the thigh. It's the longest, heaviest bone in the body and articulates with the hip bone at the hip joint and with the tibia of the leg at the knee joint. Now, if you're looking at the femur, you're going to look at, from the anterior view, you're going to have uh, a bunch of different bone markings here. Again, they're very, very important. The greater trochanter is the large roughened site, extends laterally from the head to the shaft, the site of a large tendon attachment. At the shaft, which is also known as the diathesis of the femur, you will also see along that going up until you reach the head, which articulates with the pelvis acetabulum. The neck, which joins the shaft at the angle of about 127 degrees. This is how we have the displacement of weight going from the axis now down through the lower limbs. 
You have the intertrochanteric line, which marks the edge of the articular capsule of the anterior surface of the femur. From the anterior, you see that you have a lesser trochanter, which projects posteriorly and, me and medially from the junction of the head and shaft. The abductor tubercle marks the attachment site for the abductor magnus muscle. Now, to help you, keep in mind, this joint has a limitation, even though it's a ball and socket joint. You have to have a lot of support here because a lot of the weight is going to be displaced. So you go from uh, the hip joint down to the knee joint as we move down into this uh, femur. You have a patella surface, which is a smooth surface where the patella will glide over. The lateral medial condyles are attachment sites for the fibular collateral ligament of the knee and the leg muscles. The knee is for the lateral, the leg muscles are for the medial. The lateral medial condyles are part of the knee joint, and when you look from the posterior side, you have the gluteal tuberosity. This is the attachment site for the gluteus maximus muscle. Moving onward in the, in the posterior for the femur, we have the linea aspera, which is a rough ridge for hip muscle attachment, the popliteal surface, which is a flattened triangular area, and the patella, which is the sesamoid bone. As I've mentioned here before, the sesamoid bones are usually embedded into a tendon and so, or, or, or a ligament, and basically offer some distortion of uh, the direction of forces. In this case, it is going to be buried within the tendon of the quadriceps femoris muscle, which is a very massive muscle. When we look at the patella, we deal with the anterior uh, view, which would be the base and the apex. The base being inferior to, uh, it is basically the attachment site for the quadriceps tendon. You have the base, which is really the top. Slightly below that is where you have the attachment site. The apex is the attachment site for the patella ligament and it attaches uh, the patella to the tibia. When you look at the posterior side, you have articular surfaces. They're nice and smooth, they're supposed to be. The lateral and medial faucet. They will contact respectively the lateral condyle of the femur and the medial condyle of the femur. As you can see these here, here are the lateral and medial epicondyle condyle, the popliteal surface. You have the linea aspera here, the gluteal tuberosity here. This is all the posterior view. Of course, you have the neck and the other fovea capitis. Remember, that's that little pocket that you're going to see that there's going to be a ligament coming out connecting to the acetabulum. The femoral head is going to be deeply buried as a ball and socket, which allows it to, do, to uh, basically handle the weight load put upon it. You have the greater trochanter here, the intertrochanteric line right here. These are all attachment sites for uh, joints and for ligaments, and we're going to go into this when we go into the joints next chapter. Here we have the diaphesis, the shaft, and then the patella surface here with the lateral epicondyle, lateral condyle, etc. Here's our patella. Here is the base of it. This is the attachment site. As I said, it's inferior from the base. The attachment site for the quadriceps tendon. And the attachment site here, which is just superior of the apex of the patella here. And that's going to be uh, for the ligament that is going to attach to the tibia. From the posterior side, this has got to be nice and smooth, guys, because it's going to be uh, coming in contact with the lateral and the medial condyles of the femur. Moving on. Let's get to the tibia and fibula, and don't forget that we're going to have an interosseous membrane to help stabilize these two bones. The tibia, which is known as a shin bone, it's a large medial bone of the leg. The fibula parallels the lateral border of the tibia, but does not bear any weight, nor functions in the knee joint. So this is an interesting part. It kind of hangs there, but it's not really important. I shouldn't say it's not really important, but it doesn't play the role of the weight displacement or even in the knee joint. So let's deal with the tibia first. Tibial bone markings include the medial lateral condyles. These are articular surfaces that are going to be medial and lateral uh, to the condyles of the femur. The intercondyle eminence, which is a ridge that separates the condyles. The tibial tuberosity, which is an attachment for the patellar ligament and the interosseous membrane, which provides the stability 
for tibia and fibula, as well as an area for muscle attachment. The anterior margin, which is the ridge, extends from the tibial tuberosity distally along the anterior tibial surface. And now we come into several other things, the malleolus. With the tibia, you have a large tibial process. It's a medial projection at the ankle and provides support for the ankle joint. That's called the medial malleolus. The fibula has bone markings. The fibula is an important attachment site for muscles that move foot and toes. So you're going to have the head of the fibula, which articulates with the tibia, and then you're going to have the medial malleolus. Now, excuse me, the lateral malleolus. Lateral, not medial. So you can feel this if you just put your hand up against, let's say, your left, uh, the left, excuse me, the right ankle. You're going to feel this bump at the ankle joint on the outside of your foot, and that's going to be the lateral malleolus, and that's providing lateral stability to the ankle joint. Here you can see this. Here's the lateral malleolus here. This is as if we're looking at this um, from the, uh, basically, you could tell that this is going to be the, an, uh, the anterior view. You have your interosseous membrane. Here's the fibula. Look at that. It's a small bone compared to the big, hefty tibia. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have the head of the fibula, which has a tibiofibular joint right here with the tibia. You also have an inferior tibiofibular joint down here. Here is the lateral malleus. Here is the medial malleus. And at the same time, you have to deal with the medial tibial condyle. You will have the intercondyle eminence here and the uh, medial tibia condyle and the lateral tibial condyle. Moving onward. We're now down to the ankle bones. These are tarsals. Note, tarsal bones is only seven. But there's an importance here because they accept the body weight and transfer it to the ground. The first one, of course, is the talus. That's where you transmit the weight from the tibia toward the toes through this particular heavy bone. You have articulation between the tibia and the talus, which occurs at the superior and medial surfaces of the trochlear. Now, calcaneus is the heel bone. That's the largest of the bones uh, for the tarsals, and it transmits the body weight from the talus to the ground. It is the site for the attachment of the calcaneal tendon, otherwise known as the Achilles tendon. Then we have several others, the navicular, which articulates with the talus and the three cuneiform bones. Then we have the cuboid, which articulates with the anterior surface of the calcaneus. The cuneiform are arranged in a row with articulations between them. They're named according to their positions, medial, intermediate, and lateral. And you'll see this in a second. Let me just bring this up also, the metatarsals. Five long bones that form the distal portion of the foot. Now, uh, you're going to see the same thing that you saw when you were dealing with the uh, hand. The distal surfaces of the cuboid and cuneiform bones articulate with the metatarsal bones. Yeah, that's to a point where you saw with the metatarsals and um, the, the, the uh, carpals. And again, when you start numbering them, how do you determine the numbering process? By Roman numerals. And you start this case with the hallux, the big toe. One, two, three, four, five. Bang. Now you deal with the phalanges. Same organization as the fingers. The hallux in this case has two bones. So proximal and distal. The others have three bones, all listed as proximal, middle, and distal. Here we are. Here's the trochlear, the, the landing zone for the talus, calcaneus, navicular, cuboid, and then the cuneiforms, one, two, three. Then we have, starting with the hallux, the big bone here, the metatarsals, and the articulations between the tarsals and the metatarsal bones. So you have one, two, three, four, five, five. You also have proximal distal phalanx. And then the phalanges, proxal, middle, distal. You want to bring up one other point here that's very important when we talk about feet, and that is the arches of the foot, which allow for weight transfer. The main longitudinal arch 
ties the calcaneus to the distal portions of the metatarsal bones. You have a medial arch, which is more elastic and absorbs shocks better. You have a lateral arch, which has less curvature. The transverse arch is a degree of curvature from the medial border of the foot to the lateral border of the foot. Then we deal with an issue called flat feet. These are arches that were never formed or were lost. Sorry about the typo there. A lot of times it happens when you have individuals who are raised with either poor shoes or no shoes or something else like that. Sometimes, and it used to be that this was an issue that would actually get individuals rejected from the military because they would deal with being always on their feet. Flat feet just doesn't uh, make it. It can cause a lot of problems for being uh, being ready as a soldier, okay? Now, so you can see what these arches are. Here's the main longitudinal arches here. Notice that the transverse goes across, and you can see where these bones are again. Again, here's the calcaneal, here's the cuboid, here's the navicular. This, of course, is the talus. And then you have the cuneiform here. And then, of course, you got the metatarsals and the phalanges. Okay. Now, we come to the end of this chapter. It seems like a lot. It'll help if you do take some time in the labs and review those skeletal bones, the disarticulated bones, etc. You are encouraged to peruse the chapter review outline for pages uh, 283 to 285. Complete the review questions on 285 to 286. Complete the review sheets that you'll find on page 266 and 282. And then we're going into the next chapter on joints. So it's going to be important if you take the time to review some of the bone markings and some of the joints, particularly shoulder, elbow, knee, hip. And these will provide you with a lot of information, as well as going over some of the vertebrae again. Okay? Have a great day.